My name is Claudia Lucero. I'm the executive director of uh, Chicago Religious Leadership Network and Latin America, Sierra Land. And I wanted to take the opportunity to welcome you all uh, to our 2018 um, annual luncheon. One more year. And by the way, uh, we're turning 30 uh, anniversary next year. Almost 30 years of a tremendous work of uh, Sierra Land in the city of Chicago, and not only that, but at the federal level and even at the international level in the region in Central America primarily, and other countries in Latin America. Uh, so I wanna say thank you to all for being here with us to celebrate uh, one more year of hard work and um, fighting for justice for our communities here and there. And also, I wanted to take the opportunity to um, thank you to my uh, board members. And if they can please stand up, the ones that are here in the room. Thank you to my team. Um, Sharon, Juan Carlos, Marilyn, that probably she's in the kitchen. I'm not, oh, Marilyn, yes, right, right here. So if you can stand up, please, too. <laughs> For the tremendous work that they do. Uh, without them and their support, this is not possible at all. Also, I wanted to take the opportunity to take, uh, thank the group of volunteers that are here today, and some of them, they come year after year after year. So thank you so much for doing this. The people who are serving, the, uh, serving us the food. And <laughs> putting our, ta our table so nicely, thank you so much. Also, I wanted to um, thank All St. Patrick's Catholic Church for hosting us our luncheons. Thank you so much. And members of All St. Pat's are here, so thank you. Stand up. Also, I would like to thank you, uh, one of our members, Howard Conan Jr., uh, for his gener uh, generous sponsorship for our luncheon meal. Thank you so much. <laughs> for all the different congregations that are members that they're here today, thank you so much. Because without their support that you bring us through all the year, and the spaces that you open for us to take our programs, Sierra Land wouldn't be uh, existing. So thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> and finally, but not last, um, not least, I want to say thank you to the support for the foundations that they support our programs. That is the Helen Brock Foundation, the Crossroads, Landa Family Foundation, Pierce Family Foundation, and Woods Fund of Chicago. Thank you so much. And now I'm gonna invite uh, my vice chair, uh, Martha Pierce, to come to the podium so we can start with the program. Well, is this? Oh, now it's falling off. How's that? <laughs> Always have to be shorter for me. Okay. Um, good morning. Buenos dias. 
Um, it's wonderful to see all of you here together. And it's just great to be together on this day and in these, in these times as we're bombarded daily with news of injustice and violence and outrage. It's easy to become discouraged and overwhelmed. So it's good to be with so many sisters and brothers who share our commitment to withstanding the current of hatred and bigotry that threatens to drown us and beat us down with anger and lies and just plain noise. <laughs> Today we come together to express our resistance to that narrative, to promote instead our vision of how the world should be, a place of shalom, that is a place where all are able to live in peace, safety, and happiness. Some <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to continue to believe in that dream, but let alone to keep working to make it a reality, but it's what we are called to do. Today, CRLN honors a congregation that has chosen to live out this commitment in a concrete and powerful way. It starts, of course, with a story, one that is not unfamiliar to those of us who've been involved with this work of promoting justice and peace in Latin America for so many years. It's the story of a family mother, father, daughter, and two sons. They lived in El Salvador, where the father worked as a security guard and the mother sold vegetables at a stall in the market. The parents worked hard to provide for their family, but it was difficult, especially as they were obliged to play, pay protection money to the local gang that controlled the area. That was bad enough, but then the gang began to get interested in their pretty teenage daughter, trying to recruit her and involve her in their activities. The pressure was strong, but the parents resisted and tried to keep her safe. Until one day, <clears throat> the father of the family was shot and killed right there in the market. In grief, shock and fear, the mother, Anna, tried to keep going, but under the continuing pressure from the gang, she finally made the wrenching decision to take her three children and, in the dead of night, flee to save their lives. This is not the first nor the last time that this has ever happened, as we know. So Anna and Jessica and Danny and Walter made their way out of El Salvador, across the border into Mexico, through Mexico to the U.S. border. A difficult and dangerous journey, but they made it, and at the border, when they were stopped by the immigration authorities, Ana asked for asylum, as she has a right to do, based on international and U.S. law. She and the two boys were then entered into the asylum process, under which she can remain legally in the U.S. until her case is decided. And here's where Lake Street Church of Evanston stepped in. One of the refugee resettlement agencies contacted the church and they agreed to provide a safe place for Anna and the boys to live. They've been living at the church for over two years now. The boys are enrolled in Evanston schools and Anna <clears throat> Anna is trying to find ways to work and care for them, and the church members are providing financial, moral, and spiritual help, and friendship, and love. But what of the young daughter? Here's where the story gets sadder and harder. Because she was over 18 at the time they crossed the border, Jessica was separated from her mother and brothers. In her confusion and fear, she was unable to explain her situation to the immigration authorities, so she was deported, sent back to El Salvador alone. For a brief time, she lived with relatives, but the situation was dangerous and scary and lonely for her, and she finally decided to leave again. Once again, she made the journey to the U.S. border 
and once again she was stopped by ICE. Now she was in real trouble because being deported is classified as a felony. So she was put into jail and entered into the deportation process once again. Jessica has been detained in jail for more than two years now while her case is making its way through the legal system. And here again, the congregation of Lake Street Church, led by its Peace and Justice Com Committee and Reverend Beth Dickerson, has stepped up to do what they can to fight for her to be granted asylum and re released to be with her family. And how they have fought. I, I, am <clears throat> I am in awe of these people. They just do not give up. They have found a terrific lawyer in Texas who has devoted countless pro bono hours to crafting her defense and filing appeals and making pleas. They, they and Anna have made phone calls to elected officials, written letters, visited congressional offices, held demonstrations and vigils and press conferences. And Anna has found the courage to speak out and advocate on behalf of her daughter. As I say, they just won't take no for an answer. And three times so far, three times, Jessica has been on the port, on the brink of boarding a plane to be sent back to El Salvador. And three times, she's been called back at the last minute due to their advocacy. Talk about persistence. Talk about persistence and faith, faith in God, faith, faith in our justice system, and faith in our power as human beings and citizens to make a difference and move this world toward justice. As of today, Jessica is still in detention. She is suffering greatly in the conditions there and remains fearful of what the future will hold. Her case is being appealed once again and we do not know when it will be heard or how it will be decided. As of today, the good people of Lake Street Church continue to promote her case and also to support and care for her mother and brothers. They are doing what they can, offering what they have, hospitality, comfort, safety, accompaniment, and advocacy, what we call sanctuary. In our sacred writings, we find these words, when the stranger sojourns with you in your land, you will not do him or her wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love them as yourself, for you were strangers in Egypt. For living out and embodying this spirit, Sierra Lynn presents this award to the congregation of Lake Street Church and to Anna Hovell and her family. copy of a song called Solo Le Pido a Dios, I Only Ask of God. And I will uh, read you <coughs> the words. I only ask of God that I am not indifferent to the pain, that the dry death won't find me empty and alone without having done the sufficient. I only ask of God that I won't be indifferent to the injustice that they won't slap my other cheek after a claw has scraped away my destiny. I only ask of God that I am not indifferent to war. It's a big monster and it crushes all the innocence of people 
It's a big monster, and it crushes all the innocence of people. I only ask of God that I am not indifferent to deceit. If a traitor can do more than the masses, then let not those people forget him easily. I only ask of God that I am not indifferent to the future. Hopeless is he who has to go away to live a different culture. We want to thank CRLN for this honor at Lake Street Church. I personally, as the minister right now at Lake Street Church, don't take any credit at all. We have this wonderful committee who has, as, as uh, Martha was saying, will not give up on dear Jessica. So uh, it's with our thanks and with our gratitude that you have been supportive and continue to be supportive on what is seeming and feeling like a never-ending journey. So thank you to all of you, and thank you to CRLN. This is a, a, a big honor. Thank you. such different sizes, amazing, <laughs> part of our diversity. Um, I want to thank a couple of people who are here that we've invited as guests. Many times when we think of our public officials, we think, you know, we just can't find any help there. But we have some people here today uh, that I'd like to introduce. Leslie Combs from Jan Schakowsky's office. <laughs> Jan Schakowsky has been our champion in the Congress, especially, especially around human rights in Honduras, where she has introduced dear colleague letters, uh, one very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, that uh, six, Congress six uh, House members and both of our senators signed on to. Uh, calling on the State Department to do something to convince the Honduran government to stop persecuting human rights defenders in Honduras. And that has been a terrible, terrible problem over the last few years. It's ever since the 2009 coup, hun human rights workers in Honduras have been under attack. But we thank Jan Schakowsky for all of the work that she has done on that issue. Um, in addition, uh, Jan Schakowsky's office has been extremely helpful to, to Jessica's case. She has called on ICE over and over and over again to release Jessica. And while that has not happened, it has not been for lack of trying on their part. So thank you, Leslie, and please uh, convey our thanks to Jan. Uh, secondly, we have here Stacy Berdejo from, uh, from uh, Tammy Duckworth's office, Senator Tammy Duckworth. Thank you. Uh, Senator Duckworth, as I mentioned, Senator Duckworth also signed on to that dear colleague letter, and we thank her for that. Um, Senator Duckworth's office has also been uh, writing letters and trying to talk with ICE and trying to get ICE to let Jessica go, and nothing seems to be working so far, but we've had several miracles in the past. Uh, she was supposed to be deported many, many times and hasn't yet, so we're still hopeful that something might come through for Jessica. But thank you, thank you to Senator Duckworth's office for her support for Jessica. And finally, uh, we have in our room, uh, Claudia has already thanked all the congregations that work with us. You know who you are, and we're so grateful for your support with us. But we have a number of other partners in the room, and these are partners that we partner with um, on our program areas. So I just want to recognize that today we have Ayla Bailey here from CISPES. 
Um, she gets the award for coming from the farthest. I think she just happened to be in Chicago, but uh, CISPES is located in Washington. Um, there, uh, Kathleen Bissell Cordova is here from uh, Chicago Fair Trade. Um, Irene Romolo from uh, Organized Communities Against Deportations. Um, <laughs> and uh, Gabby from uh, Detention Watch Network is also here. We have a whole table of people from the uh, Interfaith Community for Detained Immigrants. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Daisy Funes is here from Centro Romero. Um, and Analia Rodriguez from Latino Union. We have Fred Sal from ICIRR. And uh, finally, uh, we have Chris Jeske and a student from the Marquette Center for Peacemaking. And we thank them in particular. Uh, they've provided us with a summer intern for the last two summers. So thank you very much. For that. That's me again. And also I want to uh, thank uh, Alianza Americas is also here, so thank you so much. Alrighty. Um, so I will start saying that uh, Sierra Land uh, was formed in the late 1980s. And as I said, we're about to... Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So we're about to turn, um, turning 30 um, next year. So this is a great uh, moment for Sierra Land in history. And the, uh, the founders back in the 80s of uh, Sierra Land, they get together to fight against the US foreign policy that supported deadly dictatorships across Latin America in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. Initially, uh, we saw our mission as mostly solidarity with those struggling for justice and peace in the region by challenging and changing the US foreign policy. Later on, uh, it became clear that to demonstrate a real and concrete solidarity with those facing repression in the region, we needed to offer protection for those who had to flee the violence in Latin America. And Sierra Land became the inheritor of the traditions, history, and practices of the Chicago Metropolitan Sanctuary Alliance whose network of congregations provided sanctuary to migrants coming from Central America in the, in the 1980s, offering physical sanctuary to the victims of political, economic, and social violence generated by our government. Through our member congregations was and remains an important element of Sierra Land's mission. However, in the, several, in the past several years, it has become clear that Sierra Land cannot be satisfied with the limited view of sanctuary we held in the past. We are called to move beyond simple physical sanctuary to the idea of expanded sanctuary. And this year's annual luncheon, entitled Sanctuary for All, focuses on this broader understanding of what it means to provide sanctuary. One element of expanded sanctuary is the establishment of sanctuary policies and communities at the municipal and the state level. There has been much success in recent years advocating for this type of political sanctuary for the immigrant community. But such sanctuary remains constrained, limited, and far from a guarantee of safety for immigrants. Ultimately, immigrants still face criminalization and therefore face the constant threat of deportation, discrimination, and exploitation. A major component of expanded sanctuary is the recognition in Latin, the Latin American and Latino immigrants share their experience of marginalization and a state-sponsored violence with other similar oppressed communities. In particular, 
the African-American community has long faced the same forms of criminalization that plague immigrants in the U.S. In 2017, Black Youth Project 100 and Mi Gente created a campaign called Expand the Sanctuary to build an alliance between immigrants and African-Americans. Sierra Lane joined the campaign. It questioned Chicago's claim to be a sanctuary city and suggested ways to change city policies to protect immigrants from immigration and custom, customs enforcement, well known as ICE, and to change policy practices that profile and criminalize people of color. So far, this campaign has focused on local advocacy to further limiting the extent to which Chicago police cooperate with ICE and ending the use of the gang database. Our work with this expanded sanctuary community is allowing us to break out of all silos and embrace more comprehensive approaches to achieving justice and peace. Also, I would like to take the opportunity to mention that the incidents that happened during the last week are clear, clearly the outcome of the hate promoted and exacerbated by the current administration. The horrific anti-Semitic violence at Three of Life Synagogue, a house of Jewish worship in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, killing 11 people and injuring several, many, uh, several more. The mail bombs sent to people who have been criticized by the president by a man who railed against some Democrats and other minorities with hate messages online and posted even on his vehicle. And last, a white man with history of violence shot and killed two African Americans in Kentucky Crozier store following a failed attempt to barge into a black church. A witness mentioned to investigators that the perpetrator told a bystander that whites don't shoot whites. And this last one, by the way, that it was not really uh, tall in the mainstream media as the other two uh, tragedies. And all these incidents happen in 72 hours and they have something in common, hate. We need to stop this hate. And I'm glad that we're here today so we can embrace a message of love and respect for our brothers and sisters whether they are immigrants or not, whether they're from another nationality or ethnic groups, and also for the people who stand and speak up in solidarity with of the oppressed communities. The level of hate monitoring engaged in by the current administration had reached truly dangerous levels as we see with Trump's use of the so-called Honduran refugee caravan to further demonize migrants, and now his desire to try to undo the 14th Amendment with an executive order, an amendment originally passed to give former slaves citizenship. We're living in dangerous times, indeed. In that spirit, it is my pleasure to welcome Reverend Dr. Marilyn Pagan Banks to our gathering. Reverend Pagan Banks is a queer, womanist, freedom fighter, minister, teacher, and learner who exemplifies the unity of multiple marginalized communities. She currently serves as the executive director of a Just Harvest a Rogers Park-based anti-poverty organization. She's also the pastor of San Lucas UCC and an adjunct professor in McCormick Theological Seminary. We have asked Marilyn to address ways we can continue to join forces to protect immigrants from ICE and African Americans from police violence. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for joining us. And please join me with a big of applause to welcome Reverend Pagan Banks. Oh. 
Good afternoon, siblings. Buenas tardes. It is indeed an honor to be here with all of you this afternoon. And don't worry, I'm not going to like use all of this. <laughs> Y'all are probably like, man, she's never going to leave. Uh, there's lots of reports here that I'm referring to um, that a lot of our friends that were mentioned uh, helped put together. Uh, so I have them in case people want to look at it later. But it's, a, it's an honor to be here breaking bread and celebrating good works and even uh, spending a moment to hold space and to grieve with one another and also try to find ways that we can continue in this struggle faithfully and even with an amount of joy and with a determination to win. Amen? Amen. It's great to be here to find new ways to remain faithful in this work, relevant and powerful in the midst of struggle for justice, peace, and wholeness for our creation, and indeed for all of creation and God's people. I bring, I bring greetings from the Board of Directors, Partners, and Community of a Just Harvest, and I have three of our team members here today, Curtis and Steve and Maggie. Give a shout out over there. Woo! <laughs> we are an organization that daily strives to be and become a hub committed to community wellness in the most profound sense. Feeding the hungry, setting welcome tables of power and possibility, cultivating abundance and awareness of the gifts of the community, and seeing beyond what the present moment might assert and declare, and for us in, the, in that, proclaim a vision of shalom, beauty, prosperity, and unending possibility. Thank you for the invitation to spend some time with all of you today. If you would pray with me. I feel like I need to scoop this up, because I'm, I'm, I'm like, I can't have be this tied up against the stage. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. All right, yeah. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. And I'll Unto you, oh, draw me, Lord, oh, draw me, Lord, oh, draw me, Lord, and I'll run unto you. God, I pray that you would draw a word from me. Draw a word that encourages, a tender word that agitates, a word, God, that would inspire all of us to open our hearts. Draw out love from us, God, so that we might be a people, that we might be a people, that we might be a people whose arms are open to those journeying towards the American dream, and even a people with hearts open for those attempting to thrive in the midst of an American nightmare. God, draw us closer to one another and to you as we seek to be a people that is, provide sanctuary, creates sanctuary, and opens our arms to all, welcoming all even as you draw us to you. In your holy name we pray, amen. amen. Now for those of you that are engaged in justice actions, you may have heard folks do what is called a mic check. It's a way of getting crowds, getting the crowd's attention and engaging them and sending a message to the target. It starts off simply by shouting, mic check, mic with a raised fist. Mic check, mic <laughs> until everyone is responding with the same mic check and raising their fists. And when it seems like the crowd is all together, focused, the leader begins to tell her message. With each declaration, the crowd repeats it. This type of collective speaking is powerful. It ensures that everyone is together. The message is on point and that all are heard. Mic check is a way to quiet the noise and to check the pulse of the crowd in order to get the collective narrative out clearly and powerfully and make sure that without a doubt we are being heard. 
Now there's a similar practice used in the work of restorative justice through circle keeping. Now it is called checking in. It's a way to bring yourself fully into the space in order to release the noise, the distractions, the worry, the mess. With all that's happening in our lives and all that's happening in the world, sometimes we need to stop and check in. Now, I have to say that with what's been happening with me and what's been happening around me and with my loved ones, I, you know, on the way here, my husband was in a car accident and what, you know, what's been happening even in my native home of Puerto Rico, I need to check in. And I've been having to do this a few times even before I speak to a group. So folks could know my heart. So please allow me to check in this afternoon. Soy orgullosamente Latinx, specifically a member of the Puerto Rican diaspora. And as a Borinquena, I hold within me the story of and the history that created us, each of us the good parts and the ugly parts. We come from a kind, tender people. We also come from the acts of greedy and violent people. We come from a resilient and powerful people. We come from a regal heritage. We come from an enslaved beginning. Our story is not simple, but it is in the remembering and the uplifting and the embracing of it that we move and have our being. Whether born on the island or as part of the diaspora, I am checking in. As a Puerto Rican, I'd like to remind the world that I am of African descent, orgullosamente africana. Even while I stand here with all of my privilege as a Latina born into American citizenship, my African ancestors whisper into my ear the question, at what cost? My indigenous Taino blood seems thicker these days, coursing slowly within my veins, causing me to slow down and to think about what freedom really means. I am checking in, not as an expert on the topic of sanctuary, anti-immigration, or anti-blackness, but as a mother and a grandmother to children whose beautiful dark skin has been criminalized, weaponized, and deemed a threat by the very system that purports to be in place to serve and protect. Children who have already experienced police violence, harassment, and terror. Children who have shouted on the street, please don't kill me, when they see a police car pull up. I am checking in. As a family member that has witnessed the devastation caused by deportation and the separation of loved ones as the only connection my grandson has to his paternal grandmother in Belize is by telephone and FaceTime. I'm checking in. As a sister and one who has too many loved ones caught up right now in the mass incarceration and criminalization system, some recently paroled, some that will be away for a long time, some awaiting trial for over two years in Cook County because the family cannot afford to pay his bail. Not found guilty, not found guilty, not found guilty but yet in jail because he is poor and he is black. I am checking in and invoking the memory of Remus and Valam, two uncles in our family whose lives were cut short by gun violence and whose black lives did not matter to the media or authorities because they may have been gang related. I am checking in as a community leader who had to step in as a staff member was being jacked by the police simply for standing outside of our office and doing his job, which was to talk to the young men on the block, invite them to a table being set for them to come and begin to politicize their anger and to find a way out of the system designed to destroy them. I am checking in as I honor the memory of a relative from Veracruz, Mexico, Francisco Calles, who immigrated to the United States. He fell in love with an African-American woman and began a family in the 50s. Beautiful children. But he didn't teach them Spanish. And he told them he was raising them to deny their Mexican heritage because he believed at that time that it was easier to be black in America than it was to be Mexican. I am checking in as a seminary professor who just last night listened to an African-American student respond to a reading on the accompaniment work done in the 80s by Concerned Christians. The book that you had me read, Pastor Dan, where you at? <laughs> Grains of wheat. Christians doing great mission work in a war-torn Latin America 
in war-torn Latin America, countries impacted by the influence of the US, and he asked out loud, and I paraphrase, where was the concern and solidarity of these people when the United States was committing acts of terror right here against black people, against my people in the 80s? Friends, I am checking in. I am showing up in this space and in this moment not as a policy expert on immigration, not as an issue expert on anti-blackness or mass incarceration, but as someone who knows in my bones, as someone who in my very flesh and in my heart and in my lived experience with every breath that I take that the black and brown community must unite. The black and brown community must unite. Our very survival depends on it. Our stories and our struggles. Our stories and our struggles are connected. When I say I am of African descent, it's not because I'm trying to appropriate some other tradition. It's because it's true. And I need you to know, and I need to know so that we can at some point begin to connect our fight, because I'm tired and I can't fight by myself, and together we can win. Amen. We are of the same seed. We are from the same seed. And coming together does not and will not erase our unique experiences or wipe them away, the re won't wipe away the real oppression that our distinct communities face. Not allowing the white supremacist system that has been built on our backs and seeks to destroy all of us to continue to exploit our pain and anger and fear with their wedge tactics, scapegoating and methods of pitting marginalized communities against each other. Not allowing this to happen, we must unite and build collective power in order to win and have victory and build the beloved community that we all desire, that we all deserve, that belongs to us, that is our innate right. Amen. We have to connect on what we have in common and see ourselves not as other, but as co-collaborators and co-conspirators in this human project towards liberation, justice, and wholeness, and in the fight against anti-blackness, anti-immigration, anti-immigrants, and xenophobia. We have to come together. We are of the same seed. Now to our white allies and everyone here committed to creating sanctuary, spaces of protection and places where people not only, not only thrive, but survive, not only survive, but thrive. Those we welcome from other countries and those that live here but have never felt welcome. To my white friends, you must do your part in making the connections in and through your own efforts. I'm not saying do our work for us. I'm saying do your own work, <laughs> all right? When you occupy spaces or when you have a platform, you can be a part of changing the narrative and making sure that you too are part of building the bridge that's necessary to ensure sanctuary for all. Now you may be thinking, finally, she's on the theme for the day, sanctuary for all. But really, haven't I been on the theme the whole time? <laughs> what better way to talk about a thing than to start with knowing why it is vital? Now my staff colleagues here today can attest that we've been spending significant time in, in kind of pondering and uncovering and rediscovering the why behind what we do. So why sanctuary for all? Claudia spoke on some of it already, but let me just share a little bit. Because the same evil is at the root of mass incarceration and the detention of undocumented immigrants, which is private interest and profit making at the expense of black and brown bodies. A recent New York Times article's headline read, for private prisons detaining immigrants is big business. 
Today, privately run prisons have become the government's default detention centers for undocumented migrants. Core Civic, formerly Corrections Corporation of America, is a leader in what is now a roughly four billion, four billion, four billion a year American industry. For-profit prisons, privately owned and operated, and a key function right now for them is to watch over undocumented immigrants. The article goes on to share that nearly 13,000 children, children, where's that baby? <laughs> children <laughs> are in these facilities right now. And while Illinois does not operate any private prisons yet, <laughs> a report entitled Following the Money of Mass Incarceration that was released in 2017 shared that private companies that supply goods to the prison commissary or provide telephone service correction for correctional facilities bring in almost as much money, $2.9 billion, as governments pay private companies the $4 billion that I just mentioned. They're making $3 billion off of our folks being locked up. Now, I can personally attest to the cost of incarceration on families wanting to support loved ones through commissary and, and, and wanting to stay connected via phone calls, and even this new email system that they have, which requires that you purchase stamps. So let me tell you something. I don't know how many of y'all got somebody locked up. I got a whole lot of folks locked up. And we can get caught up on what they did or whose fault it was or, you know, whatever, right? But the fact of the matter is that we talk about how much money we're spending without realizing how much money is costing and what is costing beyond money to our loved ones, not just those locked up, but the further impoverishing of families who are trying to stay connected to their loved ones. You understand? They can't just pick up the phone and call and see how they're doing. They're having to sue in the system to get medical attention in order to not die while they're there. My brother is going through that right now. Having issues with his kidneys. And the other thing is, they're in there. Another way that corporations are getting over the evil of it all is that they're in there making products that are being sold out here on the street and in, you know, in the market and being paid pennies, pennies, pennies. So while folk who think they know something about where their tax money is going and say, well, we're supporting you know, this system, really, you are, yes, <laughs> you are supporting the system with our taxes, we do. You know, for the for the publicly funded prisons, but the, but the inmates themselves have to buy their own soap. They have to buy their own deodorant. They have to buy their own shampoo. They have to buy their own food if they want more to eat besides what's given them at the hours that is given them. This is a money making business that's happening right under our noses. This is a new way of enslaving our people and having them work for nothing for corporations that are making money off of their backs. And then these corporations are further impoverishing our communities and the families that are left behind because they have to pay to be able to keep in touch and, and to hold on to those relationships so that if and when someone comes home, there's a semblance of family still in place. It hasn't been destroyed. It hasn't just faded away. So while there aren't pris private prisons in the law, there's certainly money being made off the nearly 41,000 bodies locked up right now. 41,000. 41,000 bodies locked up right now. And if you look up the history, and I've, I've, I've had it somewhere, it hasn't been that long. It started with like seven. There's like 25 or more institutions now. That happened pretty quick. They're jumping up all over the place. 
And what happens is they're jumping up in places where people need jobs, so those people begin to vote against their own interests and against the interests of people of color because they need those jobs. It's an ugly, ugly, and I would cuss, but I'm not, because I'm not in my own church. <laughs> it's a messed up system. <laughs> <laughs> and from these 41,000 bodies, 56% of them are black and 13 Latinx. Now let me just say that 13 is low because that number is not including those who are in detention centers because they're in the private systems, okay? That number is way higher than this number that I just mentioned. So why sanctuary for all? Because the same hate is at the core of demonizing poor black and immigrant communities. Law enforcement officials continue to abuse, terrorize, and murder black and brown people with impunity because black and brown people are labeled as rapists and murderers and thugs and a threat because they're big and they're tall and I thought they were older than they really were. I couldn't tell that he was only 12 years old playing with a toy in the three seconds it took me Now while we celebrate the indictment of Jason Van Dyke, the police officer who shot 16 bullets into Laquan McDonald, most of those after he was already on the ground. He lit his ass up. There was smoke coming off of his body as it jerked with the impact of each bullet. How the hell was this man scared? That hate. While we celebrate that indictment, there are too many that have been found not guilty or have never even missed a day of work or been charged for committing murder against unarmed folks attempting to breathe while black or seeking the so-called American dream while brown and un documented. That hate at the core is there for both black and brown communities. Sanctuary for all. Where can we begin, friends? Because I don't know about you, but with everything that's going on, and even when we have a win with everything that's going on within 72 hours, and that's out there. We ain't even talking about what's happening right here in our own communities or in our own households within our own space. Sometimes I want to get up under the bed. Not, not, not only not get out of bed, but get up under the bed. <laughs> because I don't, I don't know where to begin. So we, we begin where we can and we join in the great work that is already happening. And one way that CRLN has been involved and is now inviting all of us to join is in the campaign to erase the gang database. Yeah. On October 16th, which happened to be my wedding anniversary, it also happened to be the day my son was jumped by four men and they broke his jaw just recently, so I'm telling y'all that I, you know, it's by the grace of God that I'm not under that bed today. In the Southside Weekly, April Lane wrote, in Chicago and around the country, police departments are increasingly using databases to log and track purported gang members. The gang database is actually contained within CPD's larger data system called Citizen and Law Enforcement Analysis and Reporting. It, and the acronym is clear. <laughs> but how many know ain't nothing clear and it's all shady, <laughs> okay? Police officers log people in the database during traffic stops and other routine searches, even while no arrest has been made, okay? If an officer notices certain tattoos, right, piercings or colors that might hint at, at possible gang affiliation, I'm probably in that list because I hang out on that block with them guys all the time and don't talk to the police. A person also might be logged in if they, they self-admit, or if another source tells the police that they are gang affiliated or if they are stopped while in gang territory. 70% of 
of the 128,000 adults in the CPD's database are black. 70% are black, 25% are Latinx, and less than 5% are white, according to a June report from the UIC Police Scene the Chicago Research Group. She continues to report that the CPD does not release information about minors within the, the database, but the report estimates that there are t between 28,000 and 68,000 minors in this database. Spe and that the database specifically targets black and Latinx Chicagoans. There was a part in this report that I didn't put in here, but I'm going to mention it, that the number of contacts in West Ridge, which is a neighboring neighborhood to Rogers Park, there was a high contact of whites. That means that the police stopped them for whatever reason, right? And they have to fill out these contact forms, whether they're arrested or not, but they made a, some kind of, but <laughs> the number of whites on the list in the, in the database is way, way low. They, they were stopped and talked to or whatever, made contact with by the police at a higher rate than African Americans and Latinos in West Ridge only, but they were the smallest number. It, it's a minute number of those who were added to the gang because they're not part of the targeted population. The report goes on to say that inclusion on the gang database can have terrible consequences. These include anything from losing your job or not being able to have access to a job or being subjected to heightened harassment by the police. That same young man that got stopped outside of my office, wasn't doing anything, was standing outside of the office, but they wanted to run his, and the, when I went out there and started talking to the police, the other p officer was already running you know, his, 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 his ID and got mad because he says, you didn't tell me that you had a record. You didn't tell me that they, you know, X, Y, Z. They had this whole list. He was already part of the database. Right? So it didn't matter that he was standing outside trying to do his job. So being, you know, when they stop you and they pull up your name and you're on a list that you may not, and the other thing is you might not even know you're on the list. Because you're at it without knowing that you're at it just because they think that's where you belong is on a gang database list. They're neither notified nor given a means to challenge their inclusion, making it nearly impossible to be removed once you're on it. Now, there's some lawsuits going on, and there's folks in this room you can talk to about some of that. Um, but the report goes on to say that there's sig this database has significant impact on undocumented communities in Chicago. That though Chicago is a sanctuary city and has passed legislation and even most recently passed uh, some amendments to the legislation, it contains what are called carve-outs. That means uh, you're, 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 the sanctuary uh, ordinance will cover you except four, right? And one of the except fours is if your name is on this gang database list, then we can work with ICE and have you deported. I'm sorry? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, conceived in the summer of 2017 in the wake of the election of you-know-who, the Erase the Database campaign is a collaborative effort between black and brown-led organizations, including some of our friends here, Organized Communities Against Deportation, woo <laughs> Black Youth Project 100, Mi Gente, and later grew to include the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council, Blocks Together, and the Latino Union. The long-term goal of this campaign is to eliminate the Chicago Police Department's gang database, which organizers say is unconstitutional, inaccurate, and disproportionately, again, targets black and Latinx individuals. Educating the public is an important part of this campaign. And this is where we come in, friends. This is the something that we can do and how we can expand our work of sanctuary. The coalition believes that in order to successfully organize, individuals must understand what the database is, what it does, and who it primarily affects within their communities. So in partnership with these coalitions, CR CRL and when Cynthia was here, I don't know if it's still happening, I, <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure it is, because that's why I was asked to talk about it, has hosted teachings on the gang database. But we need to continue this education and this mobilization. 
Again, what can you do? Maybe this isn't your community. Maybe you're not part of a black or Latinx community, but the fact of the matter is is that all of us have legislators and elected officials that we can influence, and so we need to educate our people so that they're having conversations with the elected officials and making a push to make sure that we erase the database system. Right now, again, in that lawsuit that I mentioned before, and. Uh, there's a list of demands against the city of Chicago and the, and the Chicago Police Department, and there's nine. I'll quickly name them. One, stop the use of the gang database. The CPD should put an immediate stop to the practice of designating people as gang members, affiliates, or associates. Two, stop sharing information in the database. You know, while we're cleaning it up, stop sharing it. Cease the sharing of information to any third party, including other local police departments, criminal courts, housing agencies, federal public welfare programs, ICE, FBI, and among others. Because, you know, that man who it only took three seconds to kill that 12-year-old, Tamir Rice, we say his name, was able to get a job in another police department or came from another police department even after he was messing up there because nobody was sharing his shit, right? But you want to put people on a gang database and then share that information to cause damage to people, put baggage on them that they may not even know that they have. Can you imagine having to walk through this world and already carrying what you know you carry, but you're carrying stuff that you don't even know you're carrying, and it's putting hindrances and blocks and keeping you from being able to care for yourselves and your family. Stop sharing information in the database. The third, remove all minors from the database. Anyone under 18 years old should be removed from the gang database. Do you know there's a law, and I don't know if it's just the state of Illinois, that says if, so, uh, if someone's over 12 years old and they're in the hospital and they do a tox screen on them, that they can't release that information to the parents because some, of some kind of law? So you can't tell me that my son might be using something, which is why maybe now he's engaging in problematic and, and, and possible life-threatening behaviors. You can't tell me that, so, and so I don't know how to support him, but you can put his name on a database and share it wherever you want to and cause further damage to his life. The system is just all messed up. And it's intentional, it's not accidental, it's on purpose. It's on purpose. Four, remove all people added in the last five years. All people listed in the database should be removed. Remove, review the gang database. Conduct an audit of the database to determine its accuracy if information is found to be unreliable. So we want to erase it, but in the meantime, come on now, <laughs> right? Create an appeal process so when people do find out that they're on there, that they have access to appealing uh, and contesting the information that's found there and are able to, to move on with their lives. Let people know if they are on the database. And um, again, for anyone removed from the database, CPD has to notify external agencies. So if you get to tell folks that they're on it, once you take them off, then use that same pipeline to tell folks that they're no longer on it, to let those agencies know, right? And finally, make the gang database public. CPD has to make it public for all sh Chicagoans so that people are beginning to, you know, are able to begin to see uh, that they have some sort of recourse. <coughs> I'm, I'm almost done. The coalition has also drafted an ordinance in hopes that the city adopted. The drafted ordinance calls for the city to temporarily stop adding people again, what we just said, while OIG completes its investigation. And it also requires the city to notify anyone who's been added. This past July, 22nd Ward Alderman Ricardo Munoz, um, who represents much of the predominantly Mexican little village and is an admitted former gang member, pr proposed a version of the coalition's ordinance to city council, which despite being signed by 43 of his colleagues, has stalled in the Committee on Public Safety since being introduced. 43 of his colleagues signed on to it, and it's still stalled. Okay. We know that we've got elections coming up. Mayoral and automatic elections in 2019. This is an opportunity again. What can we do? Begin to have conversations with our elected officials. Begin to 
influence those who are in office and, and, and are expecting and hoping to have our support and our vote to make sure that they are paying attention to the fact that we talk about and brag about to the world that we're a sanctuary city, that we indeed are a sanctuary city for all people. Amen? Amen. This is a lot of information. And I know that for many of you, I'm preaching to the choir. But I'm inviting us to begin to sing a new song. The same songs aren't going to work. Sometimes even the same tactics aren't going to work. We have to be just, a, just as creative and just as diligent as those creating systems that are oppressing and marginalizing our communities. Just what we just heard today about what's happening with the 14th Amendment. These are dangerous times. And they require us to be just as fearless, even in the midst of despair, just as determined, even in the midst of not knowing exactly what to do. We need to come together. We need to remember that we are of the same seed. This work of sanctuary needs to be a work that is inviting and welcoming and supporting all. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was very special. I'm Linda Eastwood. I have the honor of being the chair of the board of CLN. And you may think we're almost done, but there's some important work still to do. Um, and it starts with you picking up the baskets on your tables. And you'll find some chocolate in there. Feel free to share it. Uh, but you're also going to take out a pen and a pledge card and ideally a checkbook or a wallet or even your mobile phone. We've given you a way of giving money on your mobile phone. Uh, but surely you've already paid for lunch. I know you have, or somebody has, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be done. And those of you who've been to CRLN lunches before will know that at this point we collect and we collect half for CRLN and half for another cause. And there are so many things that we could have chosen this year. Uh, but what we've decided to, to um, put the other half of the money towards is uh, supporting people on the, in the Central American immigration caravan. Um, you all know about it. You all know the threats that people are facing. I'm going to read you just a couple of paragraphs from one of my sources, which happens to be um, a British human rights photojournalist by the name of Sean Hawkey, who is traveling with the caravan right now, documenting it for Act Alliance and Lutheran World Federation. And I think he asks herself, himself some of the questions that we do. He says, I keep asking myself about the sense of this march. Thousands of people heading towards a closed and hostile border on a journey full of discomfort and, play and pain. Why are they doing it? And he talks about the lack of organization. He talks about people who are, who are sick and are still traveling. But he says they have nothing to lose. They don't care if they die trying. They're fleeing from violence. They're fleeing from climate change. Even though their chances of getting into the US are so low, they are desperate enough to try and come. So half our collection today will go to support the, these asylum seekers. What form will that support take? It will depend on how the needs unfold. We have windows in through various partner organizations, including SOA Watch and Honduras Solidarity Network. Um, and we will let you know, as time goes on, how we use this money in the best possible way to support those asylum seekers. But the need, as you all know, is very great. So please give generously and know that someone in deep need, someone desperate enough to join that migrant car caravan, is hoping for your support. Thank you.
Well, uh, besides that, obviously, as uh, Linda said, and as we've heard from uh, the Reverend, uh, there is a lot of work, a whole lot of work. Uh, on your uh, tables, you should have three sheets. We have uh, two action items that you can do now, and we do ask that you do now. Uh, the first one uh, has to be delivered to the Illinois representatives in the United States House of Representatives, Illinois senators in the United States Senate. That petition is for us to defund the detention and deportation machine. Uh, as you know, ICE, I don't, or maybe you don't know, uh, Trump's DHS is, uh, eats up a lot of money. Uh, and ICE and the border, uh, Customs and Border Protection Agency uh, continue to request lots of money. It's to increase immigrant detention, to recruit more Border Patrol guards, uh, to hire more U.S. attorneys for immigra uh, immigration related cases and also for more local forces to work uh, on immigration. Uh, as was mentioned, the gang database is one of those tools here. Um, but we can't forget that the suburbs are also making their own gang databases. So this work certainly requires our attention. So I ask you to please Take that sheet and sign your name, put your address and city and zip and code with one of those pens from the basket. That's action item one. We will send this on to the appropriate people. The second action item is, uh, we are the Chicago Religious Leadership Network on Latin America, but obviously our work, as we are well aware, uh, is beyond Chicago, historically in Latin America, but also in surrounding communities here. Uh, one community that we connected with is uh, Kankakee. Uh, Kankakee currently uh, detains uh, immigrants, and they're looking to expand their detention center um, to get more money from ICE. They see it as a, as a money maker. Unfortunately, as many communities do, and it was mentioned as well previously. We will send this, uh, if you please sign your name, put your address, city, uh, and zip code. We will also send it, we will send this actually to the uh, Kankakee uh, County uh, Board members, the president and vice chairman, their chairman and vice chairman. I hope you sign these, these two sheets, please. And finally, I have uh, two take-home action items. Uh, as we have heard um, about uh, Jessica, Jessica Jovel, and her mother and her family, uh, they have found support. Um, in the current environment, it's obviously incredibly difficult to, to break through, but um, a number of legislators have stepped in and spoken up and have worked to, to support Jessica. We ask that you please call them and thank them for their support. Um, you can even check off once you're done, uh, once you're done calling them or e uh, emailing them Check off that you've done it, and ask them to continue working on that, please. And on the back of the sheet, this is the sheet that has a CRLN small end to the on the left top left corner. On the back of that sheet, uh, we have a take-home action item number two. And I spoke with, uh, and I must say, your name is Shanti Elliott, who's been an inspiration to me and who has worked closely with Anna and Jessica, um, asking her what she might, what she thought might be worthy of our time, especially in such a difficult case. And she said, why don't you re reach out to Jessica and support her? Um, so how can you support her? If you look at, on the back of that sheet, she's a young adult, 
Tell her that you're thinking about her, that we are thinking about her. Tell her that you are praying for her. Uh, Jessica loves art, animals, and dogs. Send her one of your creations in a card. She's also very devout Catholic. Uh, send her prayers. She loves to read. If you want to send her a book, it must be in, uh, but if you do want to send her a book, it must be a paperback book and it must be sent directly from a bookseller. You cannot send it from, uh, through the mail yourself. You have to buy it online or at a bookstore and have it sent directly to her. Her address, um, well, or actually it's not her address, it's where she is being detained, uh, is at the bottom of that sheet. Uh, please address um, any correspondence with her with that information. Again, these are the action items that we can do now and a couple you can take home. Yes. Spanish. Yes, uh, the question is uh, if the books that are sent to Jessica, should they be in Spanish or English? They should be in Spanish. Paperback, please. Okay. Thank you. My name is V. Mari Cubertier Cruz. Everybody knows me by Bima. And I will ask you now to stand up as you are able. And if I, if you find your safe, uh, safe space around you and if you find that you are able and you are willing and and if you are courageous connect with someone Marilyn ven acá mi hermana from a Latinx Boricua to another Latinx Boricua Marilyn is my sister so the calling for all of us is to connect with each other to work together, to be brave enough to break the boundaries, those artificial boundaries and borders that are hindering us from connecting with each other. Let us pray. Mighty spirit of love, spirit of compassion, spirit of justice, we are so thankful. Thank you for this time that we have spent together Thank you for the opportunity of sharing the table. Thank you because now we are here and we are here ready to keep doing the work that you have called us all to do. Help us God, help us mighty spirit to pray when we even cannot find the right words to pray. When we just want to crawl up under our beds we cannot find a way to bear the heavy load of carrying with us so many causes. Help us to be with each other, to receive the support that we need from each other. I ask you, mighty one, to help us depart from this place. Please provide the care and the support that we need. Help us to be continually doing the work that you have called us to do. As we say amen, we also pray for those that cannot join us today, and we extend this great blessing to all of them. Amen. 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 Thank you for being here.